and it's 1 p.m. Time to go around the world of business in 45 minutes. Welcome to Business Incorporated. Here's what's coming your way in the next 55 minutes. Another surge on Nigeria's inflation. It's now up to 33.2%. That's for headline inflation. Food inflation hit 40%. Well, we have a rebounding Naira. What are the manufacturers doing or enjoying from this? We'll hear from the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Spring meeting starts in Washington, D.C. We have a correspondent there. There's uh, Juliana Olainka. And we'll have Sarah also. And they will be filling us in. Welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Before we go to those very exciting news, let's start from what's going on in the global space. Oil prices slipped by about 1% on Monday with the market downplaying the risk of broader regional conflagration after Iran's weekend attack on Israel. Brent features for June delivery fell 99 cents. That's about 1% to $89.46 a barrel, while West Texas intermediate crude features for the United States for May delivery also went down a dollar five cents. That's about 1.2 percent to $84.61. All benchmarks had risen on Friday in anticipation of Iran's retaliatory attack with prices touching their highest since October. Iran's attack involved more than 300 missiles and drones. It was the first on Israel by another country in more than three decades raising fears of a broader regional conflict affecting oil traffic through the Middle East. Iran saying that it considers its retaliation to be over as lowered geopolitical temperature. Well, of course, uh, that action uh, brings about a lot of reaction, especially in the oil market. Nigeria is involved being a major oil producer on the continent and in the world earlier today on our business morning program, Laddie Williams had a conversation on some of the impact we can expect on Nigeria and economies around the continent. That the market did not react spontaneously compared to what happened in 1973, 72, 73 uh, Israeli Arab, uh, uh, Arab war. You can see that the market over the years after COVID have strategically balanced, strategically balanced because of the, the, the rate at which United States of America is uh, been mobilizing to produce so much hydrocarbon. And you can see Saudi Arabia has also strategic balance in their production output. And you can also see Russia have reasonable volume of crude in spite of the escalation between them and Ukraine country, our reserve is close to 38 billion barrels. Even our onshore reserve alone, we should be doing between 2.8 million and 3 million by now. So something is really wrong. And I still want to be inclined to ask Mr. President Tinubu to put up his crystal ball glasses and look critically into the structure of NMPC and ask what is the problem? Why is it that you cannot increase production of crude oil? When you have all the reserve already established, when you have most of the field that have aged, but you can invest and revive them quickly. Now let's go to gold where prices firmed on Monday, hovering near record high levels uh, in that area. Uh, the previous session as traders kept a close eye on developments surrounding the Middle East conflict, prompting safe haven buying of assets such as bullion. Spot gold was up 0.3% at $2,350.03 per ounce after hitting an all-time high of $2,431.29 on Friday. U.S. gold features was down 0.3% at $2,366.40. Despite recent U.S. economic data showing strong labor market and high inflation, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston President Susan Collins is eyeing a couple of interest rate cuts this year.
And now we come to Nigeria. Just a couple of less, a couple of minutes ago, uh, the news by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that Nigeria's headline inflation has maintained its upward trajectory, but this time soaring by 1.50% to 33.2%, up from 31.7% recorded in February. Uh, note here that that's about 3% uh, in, at the rate of increase, a little bit less than what it was in the previous uh, two months. The latest figure, which rose far above economists' forecast, is one of the highest in the country's history as the nation continues to grapple with high cost of food, transportation, energy, and services. According to the NBS, the food inflation rate, which is one of the major contributors to the headline figure, was higher at 40.01%. Core inflation climbed to 25.9% within the month in review. At the same time, urban inflation increased to 35.18%, while rural inflation jumped 31.45% in March. Let's see what this means to manufacturers, among other issues. We have the Director General and Chief Executive Officer of Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, uh, Mr. Shengu Ajayi Kadri. Mr. Kadri, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you and to speak with you today. Yeah, I wonder if it would be a pleasure. I don't know if you've uh, been able to put your eye on the inflation numbers. It just came in uh, just a couple of minutes before we came on air. Now 33.2% from 31.7%. And finally, food inflation has hit 40%. What does this mean to manufacturers? Yes, naturally, it's a worrying development. Uh, what it means is that uh, we are going to have uh, our products priced in higher numbers. And when you just oppose this with the depleting uh, disposable income of the average buyer, it means less purchases for us. But I think uh, what we have seen is that there is a deceleration in terms of the increases. So it might be an indication that some of the policies being taken by government are beginning to have impact so that it will decelerate the rate at which inflation is going. Mm -hmm. All eyes on inflation, there is need for us to bring it down. That is climbing to 33.2% does not portend good tidings for uh, the environment, particularly those of us that compete in the market for buyer's attention. So I, I think that is, is, uh, is still something that we need to tame. Inflation remains a very big denominator for looking at how well the economy is performing and we do know that the cbn and all other organs of government are trying to manage very delicate balance between inflation rate exchange rate and interest rate so this remains a challenge and for us in the manufacturing sector the cost of our input the prices of our products makes us to be in an uncomfortable uh, position but i believe that if we keep on with what uh, government is doing, we follow consistently and we continue to engage. We should be able to work seriously on bringing the inflation rates down. Mm, at least we see the, that the Naira is gaining. It's been gaining now. I think it's, it, it's getting close to a month. Um, and uh, uh, we were just having a conversation before I came on air to say, well, we see the Naira gaining, but it doesn't seem to reflect in the prices of commodities. And yet when the Naira was uh, losing value, it was quick to reflect in commodities. Yes, I think that uh, that is another development that we'll have to see in the next quarter, maybe in the second quarter of the year. Most of the inventory that we carry now uh, still carry the tag of the old rate. So if you have produced at uh, when the exchange rate was 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, it will be very difficult for you to bring down your cost because then you will be recovering and you, you wouldn't be making any profit. So what I think we need to wait for is for the impacts to start to show maybe as we move into the second month of the second quarter. But Dr. Boy, Okay. But Dr. Kadri, it was, it was quick to reflect where the Naira was losing value. We didn't have to wait by then. 
No, but we didn't produce uh, with with when the Naira was not losing value. That's what I want you to know. So maybe the Naira lost value in the first quarter of the year. In the second quarter of the year, it is regaining value. So I think we need an average of one quarter for us to be able to even add because all the inventory that we carry, all the costs that went into production happened when the Naira was losing value. So you wouldn't expect that kind of a, uh, that kind of a turnaround. But like I said, it's a positive thing. It shouldn't make us to lose the joy that we should feel, even though another conversation is to whether we'll be able to sustain the level of uh, appreciation we've had. But I think we should enjoy the moment. The CBN has done quite a number of things. Some of them we still need to work on. But that the Naira is appreciating should be good news for those of us in the in the private sector, of course, we must place a lot of caution on the fact that supply still remains very key in sustaining it, and domestic production is king in terms of sustaining it. Mm. But yes, you are, believe you should start to see the difference maybe as we go into the second quarter. Well, the sec oh, you mean the second month in the second quarter, because we're already in the second quarter. Ye yes, yes. I can see you are putting a time into everything. Uh, <laughs> it's very really important. It, it's very important, Mr. Kadri, because, I mean, Nigerians' purchasing power has been eroded. Nigerians are really feeling the pinch, you know, and then yeah. you take a certain amount of money you used to take to, to the market and you come out asking yourself what you did with it. But I'd like to know how this appreciation of the Naira is affecting your operations, production costs and all of that. Okay, so for us to start with, uh, the fact that it is appreciating is good news because we source our raw materials. Some, most of our raw materials are sourced from outside of the country, which means that we need to acquire the dollar to be able to procure it. So what this means in simple terms is the fact that we are requiring less Naira to be able to procure our raw materials. And what this should translate to is a deceleration in the pressure that we have continued to feel. So even in the parallel market and in the official market, we are experiencing this development. But like I told you, it is very important that whatever happens in terms of business is sustainable. So manufacturers in the past have suffered the high exchange rate and even though we still have an unfinished business with the uncleared forward, but that is a different conversation. So if we concentrate on how it has affected us, I think what it means is that we are now going to source our raw materials, pairs, and the machines that are not available locally at a lower rate. And this should translate into what constitutes the cost of our production. So it is a welcome development but it is something that has not yet been translated into our purchases. What I mean is that this new rate that we are sourcing the dollar, we are now acquiring it and we will use it to open from M. I'm trying to be as simple as is possible so that we appreciate it. And then we make the orders. So those production processes that will follow afterwards should be able to reflect the downward trend in the rates. I think that is the way I would like to put it. So it's a welcome development. Kudos to the CBN. There is the need for us to sustain this appreciation in the uh, in, in the uh, rate of the Naira and for us to ensure that we have supply sufficiency and the fact that we intentionally promote domestic production because ultimately that is what is going to help us to sustain this level of appreciation. If what you need is majorly determined by what you import, there is no way you'll be able to manage the rate of the Naira, I mean, to the, to, uh, to the dollar. But if we're able to ramp up domestic production so that we can substitute those things that we normally source, then we will have what will, will lead us to a fairly stable uh, exchange rate. Mm. And I guess another thing that could lead to reduction in your operation costs and consequently prices would be the Dangote diesel. Um, Dangote had told us that it's going to be selling out at 1200 which, I mean, of course, there'll be markup price and all of that, but hopefully it will not get as high as the 1005 
1006 which is being purchased at this time have you started seeing that in, in the different arms of manufacturers okay so dangote being able to produce locally should actually be a lesson to all of us you can't beat domestic manufacturing we have said it that manufacturing is a strategic choice that nations make so that they will be resilient so that they will be self-sufficient so you can imagine if all the diesel that we are going to need in Nigeria because of the inadequacy of power, we are able to rely on Dangote's diesel and it's coming at 1,200. It immediately changes the game. It reduces our cost in sourcing our energy from other sources different from the national grid that has persistently disappointed manufacturers. So that is one basic issue we must not gloss over. And this should be the recipe for other sectors that you intentionally put your money where your mouth is you promote domestic manufacturing that's the only way out so as far the effect is going to have yes and it is coming at a time that we are even having the price of uh, electricity supply going up even though there has been no evidence of improved supply but be that as it is the fact that dangote is uh, supplying us with diesel at 1200 which is a far better price than we are having before provides some sort of uh, soccer and when you combine this with the uh, improvement in the rate of the naira i think we are likely to see an appreciation in productivity in in the country so it's a positive development our members yes some some of them have, have started to acquire it but like i said the production process is not always as dramatic as what comes to it. So we are going to start to see the, the, the effect on our total cost of power in the next few months. So I think it's a welcome development for us. And uh, we should also look forward to encouraging more of the dangotes so that we will have our domestic economy being self-reliant and there will be cross-sectoral exchanges that reinforces our productivity. Dr. Katri, I heard you say that uh, in spite of the increase in um, the tariff, your 225 for kilowatts, there hasn't been the promised 20 hour or at least 20 hour supply. Is that what uh, you meant when you said you haven't seen an increase in supply? So clearly, in some cases, there has been no, uh, we've not been having the 20 hours. I mean, that's why uh, some companies or some organizations are being downgraded to band B or the so-called band B. I mean, because the clarity there is not there, but I mean, the clarity is not there, but we can see that those in band A, from what NEC uh, has said, is those who enjoy power 24 hours. We are at the moment still collating uh, information from our members as to what they actually enjoy. And that's why you can see that we have been a bit slow in responding to this new tariff order that has been given by the by, by NEC. So you do not enjoy 24 hours of supply and you are on band A. I think what is morally and in fact professionally important to do is for you, is for those people to be downgraded. And we are not talking of whether it is indeed the right price at 225. Because when you compare it with other nations, you will see that we are far ahead in terms of the cost that we pay, even though we compete in the same uh, environment. Imported products from low cost, uh, energy cost environment, find their ways into the country and they beat you in the market, not to talk of the ones we are going to produce and export. So there's need for us to be able to strike a balance as to what is right for us to pay for electricity supply, and what the parameters for determining how you place people on band. I mean, not to say that this issue of introducing differential prices for band A also is strange to us, and I don't think it's known to the mito that we always have uh, known as what is determining how we, how we price our energy. But when we get to the river, we we'll cross it, we, we are obviously going to engage NEC, for us to be able to know what is appropriate. But 225 is way too high, and the fact of a 20-hour supply is not certain. Mm. But uh, NERC, NERC, has already said that uh, our electricity is one of the cheapest in the world, in I Africa. I don't think that is correct. If you compare it with Ghana, I think in Ghana it will amount to 152 Naira 
and in Benin is 125 naira. So I think we can do the maths. It is not correct. All right. Well, we will await, you know, the gathering of uh, your data because it would be nice to know. I, I, want, I wanted to ask if you could give us an average uh, supply given to some at least majority of your members. But you say you're still gathering the data. So I, 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 I don't think or, or do you have an idea at this time? So the initial feeling we have is that many of our members that are on brand A don't enjoy 20 hours of supply. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And even in our homes, we know what is happening to us. And it can't be too different from what is happening to industries. And secondly, those who enjoy 20 uh, plus hours of electricity, there has to be a justification for putting it at 225. Because we operate in an environment that is not completely dominated by domestic production. We com compete with products from other clients that do not suffer uh, this kind of, of high tariffs. And there has to be uh, looking at the cost that goes into determining the price. Are we paying for efficiency or inefficiency? Have the people who are uh, adducing these prices, have they done what they are supposed to do by the agreements that they had when they took over those, uh, I mean, the, the discos? Have they done the right investment? Do they have the capacity? Are we paying for distribution and transmission losses that ought to have been uh, assuaged? I mean, as a manufacturer, I can't come to you and say my product is defective, but you have to pay for, for that uh, flaw. I don't think it makes any sense. So there has to be an interrogation as to what is leading to uh, the cost that they are using and what we are paying for. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Director General, Chief Executive Officer of Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, Dr. Shegwan Jai Kadri. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, now let's take a break uh, and uh, FX break, I guess. And then when we come back, we'll head to the market. Just stay with us. This is Business Incorporated Channels Television. back to watching business and corporate right here on channel television and uh, do remember that the spring meetings at washington is on uh, started today and we do have our crew there we have juliana olainka who will be speaking to us later on on this program we also have uh, sarah there sarah chibugu right there both of them will be keeping us abreast of the meetings of course we're expecting 
um, the Minister of Finance from Nigeria, the Central Bank Governor, and a whole lot of uh, economic leaders will be there. So we can only imagine the conversations that will be going on there. Just stay with us right here on Channel Television. We'll ensure that you do not miss any moment, even though there, it's happening right there at Washington, D.C. of the United States. All right, now let's head to the market. And Anite uh, comes in now. We do know that there was an auction today. My may not, may not be able to get the results today. But Anite, uh, we see inflation numbers. Uh, we have to note mm -hmm. that the rate of increase is a bit less than the last one. Mm -hmm. So I think the last one was about 3.9% higher than the previous month. Mm -hmm. This is 36 but I mean, 0.3%, should we be celebrating that? I don't know. But inflation is out and it's really high. Food inflation is even well, more that's, scary. That's, 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 what you call, oh, that's what you call a whopper because um, food inflation is the major con con contributor to the inflation basket. Of course, when you take a look at it, because when you, when you go to the market, I'm sure you've gone to the market. Many of us go to the market. Do you go to the market? I'm I, I, I do some. I do some personal. <laughs> I do some personal okay. um, buyings at the market, supermarkets, mm. and uh, general food markets. Yeah, and but it's course, really scary. Honestly, it's scary. Um, and, and and you know, it's even more scary when we hear perspectives of this does not capture the real inflation number because mm. we have not updated the inflation basket for uh, for. More than 10 years now, more than 10 years. I believe, you know. Mm. So, um, so that means the real numbers would even be more than what we see. And yet, this is high. Mm. Well, of course, and at the same time, it's also coming at a time when uh, of, we, we're just coming not too far from the festive holidays. It's not even a time of peak holiday period and you're having this kind of number for the food inflation. So it beats my imagination that what if, what if it's a festive period like uh, the upcoming um, Salah celebrations, which the will Ramadan be is sometime in June. Exactly. And then maybe like Christmas. How would the numbers So I, as I, I think we should just keep our fingers crossed. By the time inflation for April comes mm. out, you know, I, w I wonder how, what it would the, look yeah, like. To, to see the impact of, uh, of uh, both the Easter as well as the um, Edo fig tree, which, which, uh, yeah. which we just celebrated. But, and uh, and I wonder what the MPC will do about it. MPC is meeting next month, mm, obviously. Just, just next month, about a month. Is a it month going to be another tightening? And we know what that does, you know, mm. to um, the real sector? Well, any uh, to burst your bubble, we're going to have another inflation report, which which should come out before that MPC meeting. Uh, MPC and that's the inflation report that will capture the Ramadan and the exactly, Easter celebrations exactly. and all of that. And well, because this inflation number, it came in as a, I would call it a, as a very big surprise because uh, financial derivatives company FDC had projected a 32.17% uh, in inflation uh, rate for March. Myself, as well as some other... The CBN. The CBN the had Bank, it yeah. at 32. Their exactly. forecast was at 32. Also. All the consensus was at 32. Yes, we saw that 32 number. But at Nobody 33 saw 33 point, coming. 33 and it's not 33.0. It's 33 points. 33 points. Almost, almost into the half of that 33 yes. number. So, but, Scary. Uh, yeah, well, we will we'll, we'll be talking more of inflation. But first, let's take a look at the regional numbers for uh, African stock markets. Uh, Nigeria stock markets, it was barely in the green territory uh, last week, we've been seeing sell-off, but of course, Nigeria's stock market is just totted back into the red territory, but still hanging around the 102,000 points. It has dropped all the way from 103,000, which it was hanging by a thread there, but uh, still now it's all, also almost hanging by a thread within the 102,000 points. So, but at intraday, this was the last uh, uh, figure that we got, which is still uh, zero, a tad, just a 0.2%. For Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the JSC, we see the number in the red, 0.54%. That's almost half of a percent. Now, let's move over to the other side of the market. Where we see still positive figure for the Egyptian Stock Exchange, the EJX30. That was the biggest gainer for intraday at 3.36%. While Kenya, for Friday, it was up in the green, 0.40%. So that's it for the markets. Now, let's talk about the fixed income market. This time, we're looking at um, inflation numbers as well as the debt management office. 
where we're, we're, we're seeing uh, um, uh, right about now, the debt management office is conducting its bond auction for the federal government of Nigeria's bond, where they're targeting about uh, to, to raise about 450 billion naira as part of the, the 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 proceeds for this month. Of course, they will be. This is the second quarter, so they will be looking at other 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 months within the second quarter, which is for the month of May as well as June. Now, let's bring in Ebube Uneze, fixed income and forex dealer at Access Bank, for more details about this. Thank you for joining us, Uneze. Thank you, Anyete, for having me. Um, trust the day is going well. Mm. It's going very, very well. Now, let's talk inflation. 33.2%. Did you see this coming? And what's the impact on both the Naira and the fixed income markets? Well, as, as you rightly pointed out in your opening um, comments, um, most analysts um, didn't see um, inflation figures um, going as high as 33%. Um, the consensus in the market was that it would print at about 32% levels. However, the report um, re released by the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics um, this earlier today showed that um, inflation closed at 33.2%. Again, the, the uh, main driver here being um, food in inflation, which inched up to 40.01%. Um, um, th this is likely, um, it, this seems a, a bit... Um, out of place because a lot of people were anticipating that um, we were beginning to see um, inflation figures um, taper down. Although if you compare this um, based on the previous month, we can see that um, the, the pace of acceleration is slowing down um, compared to um, the previous month. In January, we saw inflation at, uh, I think, about 29%. Um, that increased to 31.7% in February. And in March, we saw it at 33.2%. So you see that it, has, it appears as though um, we are beginning to see inflation beginning to decelerate. Um, so in the, in, in, in the market, um, the market is still reacting to this. Um, the central bank is, uh, has been um, making efforts to ensure that um, they narrow that margin between um, um, in, in yields on money market instruments and inflation figures. So it looks like um, that margin has widened up a bit, although we expect that um, the impact of this would be, would be seen clearly by um, the next month's um, inflation figures. We should have the effects of of the appreciation of the naira against the dollar, as well as well, we should we also ex expecting that we should see we should see um, a, 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 the 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 impact of the base effects. We should also begin to see inflation begin to taper yeah. down a bit. Yeah. Okay, so now let's move a little bit away from inflation because we have so many markets to talk about. Uh, the debt management office uh, bond auction for April. Now, what is the level of participation for this month's bond auction? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, at the close of last week, we saw system liquidity um, stand at about $67 billion. Um, however, this was um, um, slightly mopped up by the um, Treasury bill auction that took place on Friday. We note that um, last week was a very short week owing to the um, 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 Muslim Ramadan holidays. However, um, for today, as you rightly mentioned, the DMO is conducting an auction where they see to raise about $450 billion across three instruments. There's a new um, five-year instrument, um, an April 2029 bond. Um, they are reissuing the 2031 and the 2034 papers, which we have floated in the last auction. Um, the general market consensus is that um, yields should uh, should print at um, similar levels as they did in the last auction, which is under the 21% um, rate. Uh, we expect this to remain, um, given the tight system liquidity. Um, we expect generally um, for the rest of the week that um, system liquidity would be a bit tight as a result of the settlement of these bond auctions by Wednesday. Um, there is um, little... Um, inflows expected in the system today, mm -hmm. um, save for uh, the coupons that are expected on the bond and the and the OMO, OMO bill will matures tomorrow. I think about thirty-seven billion. Um, these are the significant inf 
inflows which are coming to the system um, this week. So um, if you look at all these, by and large, the system is expected to remain a bit tight. So that would also um, have an effect in today's um, bond auction. Okay. Okay, okay, everybody. I think we'll leave it there because of time, uh, we, but we do appreciate your time and your analysis on our show. That was Thank Ebube. you. Ebube Uneze, Forex and Fixed Income Dealer with Access Bank. Now, let's go to the Middle, Middle East markets. Last week, we saw Eid Holiday uh, making its, uh, uh, its closure for the markets, although all the, the markets across the Middle East, they were, in the, they were all closed particularly Bangladesh, but by extension, some other um, uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, stock markets. But the resumption today, it was kind of a mixed picture for the Euro United Arab Emirates, where the Abu Dhabi almost 0.3%, 0.27% in the green, while the, its, uh, its other brother, uh, Dubai FM, is 0.02% in the red. Now, the other side of the market is the green picture there for the Saudi Stock Exchange as well as the Qatari Stock Exchange. Now, for the world's biggest economy, the U.S. market, uh, the stock futures, they were climbing up in the green. Stock futures, uh, they, they made some rise there and rebounding from last week's sell-off where we saw the impact of um, sell pressure taking its toll on the U.S. market. So the stock futures, they were in the, in, in, in the green for today. We saw, uh, the, first of all, Last week's sell-off, we saw this, 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 the shares of uh, Goldman Sachs early this morning making uh, a very strong impact there. We see Goldman Sachs, the shares, it, was, it jumped by 3.3% in pre-market trading. And that's after this, the company has surpassed its first quarter earnings expectations, fueled by its trading and investment banking businesses. So that's for the U.S. stock market. But last week, we had we'd seen some profit-taking uh, which followed that uh, there was a tough week last week for, for the U.S. market. But right now, we see some, some of the stocks, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, as well as the Nasdaq, all making a comeback at, for, the, for the stock futures um, uh, for Monday. And then the market will be opening at 2.30 Nigerian time. So we'll be expecting that uh, this trend will continue, except maybe some other things come out. And then with my dent, all eyes are right now on the Israel Iran tension, which has affected or is making its toll, is making its toll gradually across all the markets, the commodities markets, as well as some other stock markets, equities markets. Now, for the final market on our radar, we look at the Asian markets in the red. And like I mentioned, these, these markets across the Asia region, they also weigh in the impact of Iran's massive drone, which occurred just last week on, on, on Saturday, where Iran had fired about um, 300 drones and missiles against the military, military targets in Israel. And that, that attack was called by US, um, US President Joe Biden as unprecedented. So we see Nikkei and the, the, the South, South Korea's Kospi, as well as the Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index, all in the red, while the other side of the market, we see the Shanghai 1.26% in the green and the, the S&P AXX 200 in the red 0.46%. Now for the Asian market, they will be expecting China's uh, first quarter GDP numbers to be out tomorrow, while Japan will release its March trade data and inflation numbers on Wednesday and Friday, uh, respectively. So any, that's it for the markets. Thank you so much, Aniti, for taking us around the map. Pleasure. All right, now let's head to Washington, D.C., where, yeah, the spring meeting uh, has started, started today, is going to hold off through the week. And, of course, we did tell you that uh, we have our eyes and ears right there. So um, one of our correspondents right there is Juliana. Juliana has left the U.K. to go to the U.S. Well, I guess just a couple of travels, Juliana. Uh, uh, well, how is the uh, U.S. treating you? I hope you're not missing home yet. Good morning, Illy. Good afternoon to our viewers who are watching, of course, uh, from a GMT time zone. It's just about 8.39 in um, Washington, D.C. It's going to be a very long week. All right. So um, what are we expecting? We know normally it's uh, drilled down on economic issues in different countries. For instance, I believe on Friday, Sub-Sahara Africa will be uh, the focus, but even before then, our minister, uh, other countries, the issue of debt, debt servicing. I know uh, in the one in October, I had a lot of conversations. What are we expecting? What's on the agenda? Well, that's absolutely right. I think there are significant issues for the International Monetary Fund to try 
and resolve over the next few days. So it's Monday, of course. Um, the spring meetings actually kick off proper tomorrow. And as you quite rightly said, we're expecting there to be significant dialogue led by the central bankers of the world, but of course, supported by finance ministers. In fact, I think we're going to expect thousands of delegates journalists, observers, financial institutions to be descending upon Washington over the next 24 to 48 hours. And debt is going to be the centre of uh, the dialogue. I think it was just a couple of days ago that Christina uh, Giovina, who is the IMF uh, chief, she was uh, reinstated for another five-year post, which is important because I think uh, just a couple of days before the meeting um, kicked off, there were suggestions that perhaps it could be dominated by the internal wranglings and issues within the IMF. But now that Giovina has been cemented for, a next, for the next five years, discussions can talk about the big issues of the day, which again, as I said, is debt, not just debt. I think climate change is also going to top the bill, as well as uh, global issues. We've seen what's been happening within the Middle East, not just over the past couple of months, but certainly over the next couple of days, there are going to be some huge sound bites coming out of Washington. Hopefully, that's not going to take away from the financial discussions, which is the reasons why we're here. But global growth being stagnated certainly has a lot to do with geopolitical issues. So, for example, we have stagflation at the moment. We are seeing inflation slightly uh, easing in um, the G7 and other comparable economies. But now that perhaps we are on a brink of war between Iran and Israel, certainly I think that is going to dominate some of the discourse uh, that is happening in Washington over the next few days. Of course, Nigeria, we are expecting um, some significant presence from, from them. I know that the Minister of Finance is in town. He has um, quite a significant role at the International Monetary Fund because he was appointed just a couple of months ago. You were there in Marrakesh, um, in a, he was appointed the World Bank Chair for Africa. So there is definitely going to be a lot of pressure on him. However, uh, the central bank governor of Nigeria and the Minister of Finance at least come to Washington um, at a time where Goldman Sachs have declared the Naira the best performing currency so far this year. Who would have thought we would have been saying that a couple of months ago when people were taken to the streets um, to protest against the high cost of living in Nigeria. So there are going to be lots of conversations, lots of movement, lots of focus on Nigeria, but hopefully the African delegation can come together with one voice and demand um, for some of that finance that they will need if they are going to succeed in transforming their economies into being um, low carbon uh, sectors. Uh, I hear you on that. Uh, and yes, of course, we're happy. We're, we're smiling about the Naira and all of that, even though we expect even much more because inflation came out today and it's coming out really hot. Juliana, back here home, and it feels that way when you go to the market. But, you know, talking about African countries coming together, I know the last meeting in Marrakesh, which I attended, uh, that was also it. And there was also the conversation of should African countries continue, uh, you know, waiting on the Western countries for loans and all of that? Can't we look inwards? I'm hoping, I mean, for someone like you who were there, you could also push conversation on uh, to that direction because, I mean, for how long should Africa be depending on the Western world for loans and, and getting condition uh, for the loan? They value your currency, you know, and your taxes, and you're not comfortable with the condition, but you have to stick to them because of what you want. So, I mean, I guess it's also time for Africa to also change the narrative and, and, and uh, you know, take a lead. Do you know what, you're absolutely right. You've, you've hit the nail on the head there. And I do hope the change makers are listening to you. And I will be putting um, some of those thoughts to the Nigeria delegation um, when they arrive, um, because I think it's pretty fair to say that the Global South have a tense relationship, shall we say, with Bretton Woods institutions, which of course are the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Quite interestingly, uh, both institutions are in their 80th year. So 
this particular spring meeting is going to have uh, so much nostalgia. And yeah, the tectonic plates of the world are shifting. The trajectory of global growth is heading towards the continent. And it does always feel, um, I, I, I'm not sure what is the correct term to say, should we say irritating every time you hear an African finance minister talking about debt, talking about loans on um, television. We want to shift from that. We want to talk about domestic um, revenue generation and domestic revenue mobilization. That is the most important thing, the manufacturing, the production, supporting local businesses, giving your local um, individuals and entrepreneurs an opportunity and a chance, you know, not just um, appointing contracts um, for purposes of nepotism, which we've seen across Nigeria and to be fair, everywhere. And um, so there are going to be um, some really important discussions being held. They will be held um, to account. And as I said, I think, you know, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Wallayadun, he does have a lot of pressure um, on his back because he is not only representing the Nigerian economy here, he is also representing the African economy. So we do hope that he, he is empowered enough to shift the dialogue away from consistent asking for money and talking about um, you know generating revenue within the Nigerian borders and of course we know that can only be done if our SMEs are empowered and are given the opportunities based on merit not based on who you have in your contact book. Yeah well uh, a whole lot we're expecting there from the spring meetings Juliana uh, thank you so much for for that. Thank you. All right, I do remember we have our crew right there. Juliana Olainka is one. There's Sarah Chimugu. She's also there, and they'll be bringing us up to date on all the conversations and meetings. And yes, uh, that's responsibility expected from Nigeria's Minister of Finance, uh, representing the continent. Ministers from the continent will also uh, drill in on that in the coming days, all through this week, so you don't want to miss it. Now let's leave uh, Washington now. Over the past few years, uh, China has been growing its influence as a, as a global economic superpower. And on Friday, Chiponda Chimbalo did tell us that uh, the, the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, uh, was on his way to China to try to find out better ways that the two countries can uh, do business together. Today we continue on that, find out after his meeting on Saturday. I believe he's still there as we speak. But now we have uh, Lars Halter now to give us updates. Hi, Lars. So how has this meeting been and what are some of the key points from uh, the conversations there? Thanks for having me, Ini. Uh, well, he landed yesterday, Sunday, and it is a three-day visit. That is the longest uh, state visit Schultz has ever had in any country. And that alone should tell you how important this is. China, the economy on both sides, and the future of business relations. Also quite impressive, Schultz's delegation. He took along representatives from Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Siemens. It's a veritable who is who of German business. And that's not even surprising, to be honest. Uh, because uh, Germany's trade with China clocks in at around a quarter trillion euros per year and that makes China by far Germany's most important trade partner. And while everyone has been talking about decoupling from China or de-risking as I now have called it, it's not really what we see happening. In 2023, a German direct investment in China has reached yet another all-time high, but that of course brings a huge dependency again on China and that is what Germany and some other countries do not actually want any longer. So uh, what, are, what are exactly uh, Germans expecting from this meeting, apart from on the, you know, the macro level? <sighs> Well, let's take Scholz's guest list as a hint. As I said, it includes representatives from Volkswagen, Mercedes and BMW. That is the three largest automakers in Germany. And uh, there you go. China, of course, has invested heavily in e-mobility and BYD has taken over the global market for electric vehicles. That company's cars are built very well, but they are mostly selling because they are cheap. And why? Well, because of generous subsidies out of Beijing. And that is a key point for 
Scholz. Just this morning, he told students at Tongji University that, quote, there will be Chinese cars in Germany and Europe. The only thing that must always be clear is that competition must be fair. He says uh, that there can be no dumping, no overproduction, that copyrights uh, are not to be infringed. And that is not only the case for cars, by the way, but also for solar panels, wind turbines or steel and in many other fields. On a Tuesday, Olaf Scholz will raise these issues with Chinese President Xi. He wants subsidies scaled back. There has to be some sort of a level playing field between the trading partners. Otherwise, Western economies won't be able to compete Pete, and that will definitely cause problems in trade relations for the future and at the very least bring upon punitive tariffs and potentially in the long run another trade war. All right, let's head to the market now. How's that looking today? <sighs> Well, quite obviously, the escalation in the Middle East over the weekend is having an impact on markets. Asian markets opened lower as investors are spooked. Frankfurt, however, looks okay for now with a slight uptick even in early morning uh, trading. Uh, so we will see how stocks will cope with the new situation after Iran has attacked Israel with drones. Uh, this being the Middle East, oil will likely see some move uh, today and throughout the week. And some analysts are expecting safe havens like gold uh, to be benefiting from the geopolitical circumstances. There's also some good news for investors here in Germany. Dividends are up this year. A new study this morning says the 160 largest German companies are paying out 62.5 billion euro this year, and that is 1.5% more than last year. It's a third record high in a row. All right, Lars, thank you so much uh, for that. Now let's head to Africa now, where Kenya is poised for a sustained decline in inflation propelled by a consecutive four-month downturn in fuel and food prices alongside a robust shilling offering respite to consumers grappling with soaring costs of living. Looks like the opposite of what's going on in Nigeria. This time, the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority effected reductions in the price of super petrol by 5%. Kenyan shilling diesel by 10 Kenyan shilling and kerosene by 18 Kenyan shilling. So let's hope that as the Naira continues to surge and rebound, that we will also have a news like this soon in the country. And why it's not so good between Iran and Israel. Um, the Iran South Africa Expo, uh, the delegates from both nations converged on uh, Johannesburg in South Africa to explore economic opportunities and foster stronger bilateral relationships. However, amidst this discussion, tensions escalated dramatically, as we know, on the global stage as Iran launched a bold and unprecedented attack on Israel. So while uh, they're trying to build relationship with South Africa on the one hand, well, it's not so good with Israel on the other hand. Now, the Enugu Electricity Distribution Company in Nigeria has shared a statement informing customers of a total system collapse, which occurred about 2.41 a.m. on Monday, the April the 15th. And this has resulted in the loss of supply to uh, all interface TCN stations. Consequently, uh, there was a major interruption to service to customers. However, a correspondent in Enugu has informed us that about 10.30 a.m. Uh, there had been supply restoration of supply in some parts of Enugu uh, State and Onicha in Anambra State. Let's head to the crypto space now and see the market that never sleeps. I wonder right. if the Iran-Israel conflict did, it is It did affected. not sleep on Saturday, definitely. And it was heavily impacted you know, when we got that news that Iran you know, attacked uh, Israel. We saw a big drop. They touched about 59,000. That's uh, for Bitcoin. But let's uh, quickly talk to Olumide Additional now. Let's find out you know, how geopolitics is shaping the crypto market at this time. Hello, Olumide. Great to have you. Yeah, good afternoon, Vladi. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So the argument now is, does geopolitical tension, does it favor Bitcoin in any way? But we saw that reaction on Saturday, and it wasn't good. Yeah, and it already um, affirmed the fact that uh, Bitcoin is not yet seen as a safe even asset. You know, we saw um, heightened tension in the Middle East that brought out uh, 13 billion 
dollar worth of open position in the crypto market wiped. We saw liquidation as much as 1.5 billion dollars wiped in the um, in the weekend as Bitcoin dropped as low as 60,500 dollars. You know, before uh, retracing steps back to above 66,000 as we speak. Uh, but you know. Uh, that really had dampened optimism in the market, despite the in increased inflows from uh, spot ETFs investors, as the market seems uh, to be positioned for half in a So it's really been a very uh, parabolic, but um, uh, Bitcoin has been able to recover most of its losses. Right, uh, and most markets are bracing for what um, Israel is going to um, do next, what their response is going to be to this uh, attack. But uh, we see uh, in Hong Kong an ETF, uh, Ethereum ETF, that was approved, also the Bitcoin ETF, and that's, you know, helping prices, you know, at this time. How much can this help prices going forward? Yeah, I, I think uh, the bulls are back on um, cautiously, and also the fact that uh, Solana has been able to roll up some updates to uh, minimize the problems around congestion, and that has triggered buying pressure in Mimi coins. Uh, but, you know, it's really fair to say that uh, investors will also be looking at key U.S. economic data for the week for that guidance. And if uh, really uh, the Israelis will uh, respond to do uh, from the fiscal side of the Jewish community, it shows that uh, they are laying low for now. Right, definitely. Lower. We'll keep tracking the market to see how things uh, unfold. Thank you so much. Uh, Lumide, additional financial market analyst. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right. So, any, uh, there you have it. It's all about geopolitics um, right now. That's what every investor will be looking at. And the big question is, is it risk off sentiment for 2024? I wonder. I guess time will tell. Right. Thank you so much, Ladi. Well, that's it on the program. Thank you so much. It's a fresh week. And uh, we have uh, four great days ahead of us. Don't forget to come to channels television to get updates from what's going on at the spring meeting uh our correspondent there are really uh you know ready for us but we'll be back tomorrow to give you updates from business morning on sunrise daily and then 1 p.m i'll be back to have a great day <music>